uh, to write a second article. He's the only one with two articles in that book. So he knows what he's talking about. And he's confident, and I'm delighted that, he, that he's here to talk about, uh, quote, unequal Poland-U.S. relations with China during the first FDR administration. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, I only had 30 days to write that second essay, so if you read it, uh, forgive me for copying myself and the other one. Um, I just wanted to tell a quick Lincoln anecdote because I was so excited at that last speaker. Um, I was at the Lincoln Memorial when I was doing research for this particular topic. Um, it was one of those days off, I think Memorial Day or Flag Day or something. A busload of, I'm standing up on top of the memorial and a busload of kids gets, gets out and storms the, storms the memorial. And um, two African American kids come up, and one's wearing glasses and is dressed kind of nerdy, and the other one's wearing a Jordan jersey and is dressed kind of cool. And the kid with the glasses stands there and looks out and says, Wow, this is where Martin Luther King gave his I Have the Dream speech. And the kid wearing the Jordan outfit says, That's where Forrest Gump jumped in the water. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I'm here as the, as the nerdy glasses guy for your talk today. Um, I do U.S. East Asian relations, and I wanted to talk a little bit about um, our relationship with China during the first Roosevelt administration. Um, it starts out with kind of an interesting story. Uh, in June of 1934, a phone call halted the work at the State Department. The Department of Commerce was confused. A ship from the country of Manchukuo had shown up and was asking what duties it should pay for unloading its cargo. The Manchukuo was a conquered part of China and then a public government there had been established by the Japanese, and the United States had refused to recognize that change in Manchuria. And so the chief of the Far Eastern Division, Stanley Hornbeck, thought really hard about this, and he says, all right, here's the solution. Pretend the ship is from Mars. We'll just charge them the, the rate for a, a non-recognized country, for a, for a country we don't have a trade agreement with, but we'll just pretend that the the ship is just for outer space and we won't have to worry about actually recognizing them by having them pay this duty. Now that might seem like kind of a bizarre thing to really worry about in the State Department, but this was one of the few items that the uh, U.S. State Department did for the Chinese that the Chinese really liked. I'm going to be talking today about a series of incidents where the FDR administration although it, it had sympathy for China's situation in the 1930s, actually did uh, a series of, uh, put it into effect a series of programs that actually ended up hurting the Chinese, and in some cases actually helping the Japanese, who were seeking, in fact, to take over other parts of China at the same time. Um, sometimes we think of FDR as pro-Chinese, he liked to say he was, He likes to point back to the days of his family, of the Delano part of his family, uh, taking part in the early China trade. Um, some historians like to call Henry Morgenthau Jr. the Secretary of the Treasury for, for many years in the administration, but also at, at first the guy in charge of the Farm uh, Bureau as also pro-Chinese. And some people consider Stanley Hornbeck pro-Chinese, but I'm going to try to dis dissuade you of that thinking. Um, the first thing the State Department did that um, was a bit onerous towards the Chinese was they actually used the fact that the Japanese had taken over Manchuria as a way to hold the Chinese feet to the fire to follow the treaties that had been signed. Many of these unequal treaties that go back to the 1840s um, and later, uh, or closer to the, to the period of the 1930s, Um, benefited Americans greatly, and they wanted to make sure that these uh, treaties were followed. So here's a quote from um, Hornbeck to the Chinese minister. The Department of State has recently received from several sources communications which indicate that the present authorities in Manchuria are showing much greater solicitude with regard to, to the meeting of past and current obligations to American creditors than was shown by the former Chinese authorities in Manchuria, or is currently shown by the Nanjing government. So here is a, uh, a place where, although we're not recognizing Manchuria as a state, Manchukuo as a, as a state, we're using how they're treating Americans as a way to put China's feet to the fire and get them to treat our people the same way. 
A similar thing will happen when it comes to oil and kerosene. And this is one thing that um, has to do with the way uh, gasoline was refined at this time. The by where the byproducts from turning crude oil into gasoline in the 1930s was kerosene. And the United States was going through a period of time where we were doing the rural electrification program. There wasn't as much need for kerosene in the United States. The Chinese, however, didn't have the same electric electrical grid as the United States had. And so they were firm buyers of kerosene, which is essentially a byproduct. It was almost like free money for uh, the two great um, oil companies of the period, which eventually become Exxon and Mobil, which then reformed as Exxon Mobil. Um, what I think um, the problem they were having was that the local Cantonese government was harassing their efforts, were passing laws that were unfair to Americans. And so the United States um, foreign service officers wanted to do something to make sure that the Cantonese officials would stop that. And the way they finally ended up um, getting the Chinese to, uh, to treat the oil companies with respect was to point out that the Chi Ch Chinese had been really upset when the Japanese uh, speaker of the, of the Foreign Service, um, Amao Eiji, had told the uh, world, uh, you should basically not do anything in China. You should stop <coughs> loaning money and messing around in China. The Chinese got really angry and said, this is ridiculous. You should um, treat, <coughs> you should, um, that, that although um, the Chinese responded that all the nine power treaty countries, which included the United States, should discharge their obligations, that we should prevent the Jap Japanese from shutting the open door. The Department of State then said, fine, then you guys should follow the rules too and stop harassing our oil companies. You have to also follow the nine power treaty when dealing with American interests. And so that's how we solve this kerosene crisis. Obviously, I'm going to far more detail in the paper, but I just wanted to give you a, a brief snapshot before I get to the, to the big topic that the Chinese want to change, and that is extraterritoriality. Um, I always tell my students, extraterritoriality is the longest word we get to use in a diplomatic history class. Um, it's the rule that says that your, <coughs> uh, that Americans, in this case, are not subject to Chinese administration. That is, an American breaks the law in China, they don't go to Chinese court, they go to American court. We have similar things today. These are stand uh, status of forces agreements that protect American soldiers in foreign countries. Excuse me. And also, of course, diplomatic immunity uh, that, off that often works in a similar way to extraterritoriality. Extraterritoriality also has the benefit of avoiding the payment of taxes in many cases. So one of the first things that the, the State Department did when um, FDR took office was to try to re-examine its policies. And one of the big policies it wanted to re-examine was extraterritoriality. When the Japanese had seized Manchuria, we were in the midst of negotiations with the Chinese government over the issue of whether extraterritoriality needed to change. Um, it didn't exist for some countries because of their losses during, the, during World War I. So for example, um, Austria or Germany didn't have extraterritoriality protection, and they were still functioning as business. Business people were still functioning under those flags in China, and so there was some pretty good argument for, for getting rid of it. Um, and so we sent the assistant chief of the Far Eastern Division, Maxwell Hamilton, on a round-the-world tour to investigate conditions in East Asia. And one of the main things he was looking at was extraterritoriality: should it be continued or not? So, the, he interviewed all sorts of people there. There were 10,000 Americans living in China at the time. There was a lot of missionary activity, a lot of missionary investments, a lot of business <coughs> investments, and of course those oil companies with all of their um, supplies and distribution channels that were very expensive there. So Hamilton went there to interview some of these people and also to interview his colleagues, his foreign service colleagues there. And two of the longtime consul generals explained that extraterritoriality kept trade along the Yangtze River, China's kind of lifeblood for trade, alive and protected both foreigners and Chinese from warlords that might interfere with their legal rights. 
So even though there's a nationalist government in China, it doesn't control everything in China. There's still parts of the country that are under the control of these warlords. And um, also, of course, these uh, what, what um, Hamilton called the so-called communists, the bandits, which were actually communists, um, in, that were under uh, being surrounded at this particular point in time, or about to be surrounded, and about to break out with their long march. Um, so that was one reason to keep the uh, extraterritoriality, that it helped, it helped American trade, it helped foreign trade in general. Hamilton also was very excited about how much China had done in terms of uh, growth and, and, and uh, fixing things up. He noticed that the, the dictatorship of Chiang Kai-shek was still in effect, um, but the nation was fragmented. As I said, uh, there were Japanese in the north, the Russians were in the far west, and warlords were all about, which was another reason to keep extraterritoriality. It was a way to protect interests that may not be protected if we had to rely upon the central government's ability to protect them. A China unhampered by foreign incursions would solve its problems eventually, Hamilton explained in his reports back to the State Department. As for Sino-American relations, Hamilton found trade the chief interest on the side of the Americans. We were ranked first in foreign trade for the second year in a row, controlling 21% of China's trade. China was actually America's eighth most important trading partner, and in the midst of the Depression, that really counted for something. And we sold certain goods that didn't have a good place to be sold in other places, particularly cotton um, and kerosene, as I discussed earlier. So, although extraterritoriality and other vestiges of the unequal treaty system would need to be gradually ended, 1934 was not the time to do that, considering the state of the justice system in uh, China. But there was also a concern that Hamilton mentioned. Um, what the world did not need, Hamilton avowed, was for China to industrialize too rapidly. Mechanization, coupled with already low labor costs, would result in Chinese goods swamping world markets. I'm sure at the t time people thought that was the silliest thing you could possibly say but you know, go to a store today and try to buy something not from China, right? Um, it, it took a little lot longer than I think Hamilton would have thought, but you know, that's what world wars and civil wars do, they slow, slow down uh, industrialization. So that was the end of result of the discussion over extraterritoriality. It should be continued. There was another opportunity that the United States took um, with China, and that was the cotton and wheat lesson. Uh, from the American perspective, we could sell surplus goods, cotton and wheat, and hope their prices would rise because of the loan to China of $50 million. $10 million for the wheat, $40 million for the cotton. Chinese would buy those through the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, sell those goods back in China, use the proceeds to build some roads and other infrastructure. Although the State Department thought this was a bad idea because it might irritate our number one consumer of cotton, Japan, um, Roosevelt thought that the chance of having goods <coughs> become more expensive was far more important. And as the Farm Secretary Morgenthau said, even if the loan were never repaid, the sale of cotton would boost domestic prices, increasing the cotton stocks on hand within the United States <coughs> as much as $100 million and thus be helpful to American farmers, right? That's what you want during a depression is some inflation to occur. Now for the Chinese, they thought that they could kind of trick the United States into helping them more by putting us on the hook with the deal. But it turns out that this loan was a disaster. Um, when the first bales of cotton arrived in China, they arrived in the midst of a huge boom in cotton agriculture in China. It had been a perfect year for growing of cotton. There was too much of it available, a lot, on the market. Secondly, Chinese cotton mills used an inferior kind of cotton to make their textiles. The American cotton was too good for the Chinese cotton uh, textile plants. The only people that could use it were Japanese cotton textile plants that were located around Shanghai. So the only people that could really use the loan were the Japanese. So the Japanese at first, just to uh, annoy Chinese government and the American government refused to buy this cotton. 
leaving the Chinese in a lurch. How are they going to pay for this stuff? But in the end, they got such a good deal on the cotton that they ended up buying it at the end of 1934. The 50 million uh, cotton and wheat loan ended up selling only 17 million dollars worth of stuff. One million in flour, six million in wheat, and 10 million in cotton. It had no effect on boosting farm prices in the United States and just helped Japanese manufacturers make more money off of the China situation. <coughs> this, of course, irritated all within the State Department and in the, uh, in the administration, which leads us to our probably worst policy that we implement when it comes to China during this particular time, the Silver Purchase Act. A few Western senators, in order to um, help their miners get jobs, um, floated the idea that the United States government, the Tr Department of Treasury, should purchase stocks of silver. And during the Depression, a bunch of inflationists thought it was a good idea to do this as well, hoping that this would be a way to kind of create silver as a more important metal, uh, going back to like the 1890s, the whole idea of the Sherman Silver Purchase Act, to try to create inflation and make um, make the depression be less onerous or, or maybe even go away if, if, if everything worked out perfectly. But these senators also argued that this would help trade with China, because China was a silver currency country. And so if we have the United States government purchase silver, it would increase the Chinese government's purchasing power. So there's just all good going into the idea of the Silver Purchase Act. Now at first, Roosevelt was against it, but historians are a little confused, and, and I think we can say that a lot of historians are easily confused by Roosevelt. He often talks out of both sides of his mouth at the same time. And here's one of those instances. At first, he says this is a bad idea, but because he needs the votes of these senators on other New Deal legislation, he decides to go along with it, and he starts to back it. And he backs it in such a way that it actually appears through his statements and through his writings that he actually thinks that it is going to benefit China <coughs> and that it actually could have a very important um, effect on the Depression, or at least trade with China. So the idea behind this is that the U.S. government would buy enough silver to make um, about a quarter of the total assets in, in the Treasury and keep buying silver until it equaled $1.29 an ounce. At the time, it was about 40 cents an ounce. So it causes a huge boom in the price of silver. But of course, it's a lot easier to simply buy silver on the international market than it is to actually mine it out of the hills. So here we have one of these really embarrassing <coughs> situations, and it's this great quote by Luxembourg, the uh, great scholar of the New Deal, who says, in order to help an industry that was really small, um, we're going to do this really horrible thing that's going to cause problems, it would have made as much sense to help out the Eskimo pie industry in the United States to have some kind of purchase act to buy um, uh, chocolate-covered ice cream because just as many people made Eskimo pies as mined silver in the 1930s. I thought that was such a great quote about the situation. So it turned out, of course, everything went backwards on this. The price of silver went up, silver flew out of China, and China's economy was devastated. The United States lost 40% of its exports to China uh, in, within a year, and um, but the silver became illegal to, to transact, so it went underground through smuggling. Japanese soldiers, generals and such, made profit smuggling uh, silver out of China for sale to the United States or to the world market. Japanese soldiers also used this opportunity to kind of uh, cause an autonomy movement to sprout up in North China and interfere with the government there for uh, the next couple of years. Uh, over 400 million ounces fled China between 1934 and 1936. The Chinese desperately said, please stop this. American officials turned to the president and said, please stop this. This isn't working the way you said it was going to work. This is causing far more problems. Um, Shanghai had been relatively unharmed by the depression up until this point, but the loss of silver led to a collapse in the real estate market and led a lot of Americans to lose their businesses there, as well as far more Chinese. 
um, as the economy began to collapse. Um, American businessmen, American, former American diplomats like William Cameron Forbes, all argued we needed to do something about the situation, we needed to change something. Um, when confronted by this evidence of trouble, the president argued it was, quote, better to hasten the crisis in China rather than have its problematic economic situation continue for a generation to come. Um, and again, we're not sure if he's saying this because he's trying to cover up his closeness to the silver block, or if he's saying this because he really believes it. The Secretary of the Treasury worried about the situation and turned to the President and sent him a document called The Silver Problem on December 16, 1934. It was, a, it was classified very confidential. Um, if the United States, he wrote, is to maintain her traditional role of friendship for China and effectively to display sympathy for her and her plight, and perhaps to avoid hostile feeling against her on the part of Chinese, remedial action would seem to be the ne would seem to be necessary immediately. And he then set up a list of things we could do, uh, changing the way we're enforcing the Silver Purchase Act, being most of his ideas in different different ways. Again, the president ignored these ideas. He ignored the minister to China, Nelson Johnson, who said there's a danger in our policy. He ignored the American consul general to Shanghai, who said that the present troubles in China are all caused by the silver purchase policy. And he ignored William Phillips, Roosevelt's old friend. He had gone to the same boarding school that Roosevelt had gone to. In view of the situation, which appears to be rapidly developing, I am wondering whether you would care to consider any modification of our present policy. Roosevelt did not respond pleased by the Undersecretary of State. Even Hornbeck tried to get the United States to change its policy. He tried to argue, um, he always he tried to use the best arguments for the person, and Hornbeck's uh, solution here was to argue that this went against the good neighbor policy that had been recently implemented by the Roosevelt administration. Besides that, it could possibly destroy China's economy. The problem was, Hornbeck was also against doing anything to help the Chinese. He made a simple statement. A simple, that China was being bled white by the Silver Purchase Act, and a simultaneous withdrawal of blood and the pumping in of water would not maintain the health and strength of a sick man. So until we stop buying China silver, there's no use to loan money to the Chinese to reform their currency, because it would just be throwing more bad money after bad. In the end, the, the nationalist government nationalized their silver and changed their currency on November 3rd, 1935. Fascinatingly, at the same moment, right after this had occurred, President Roosevelt stops talking about the Silver Purchase Act and pretty much ignores what happens to it from now on. Now, the act will continue. It'll never do what it's supposed to do. It never gets to that quarter of the stocks in the, uh, in the Treasury. It never gets silver to $1.29 $1 an ounce. Um, but as Yale and China economics professor Dixon Levin says, <coughs> we harm China, quote, merely for the sake of satisfying certain economically insignificant but politically important interests at home. Well, what does all this mean? Why is this important? Why should we care? Well, first of all, we have to remember that Roosevelt, although being interested in the Silver Purchase Act, is pretty much absent from a lot of foreign policy decisions in, this, in his first term as president. The depression is simply too important <coughs> for him to take his eyes off that ball. But he did appoint people, who then appointed or either appointed or kept other people in office, that were important traders, that were people interested in expanding America's trade throughout the world to help satisfy one of the problems that depressions, right? Depressions are always caused by three things, right? Uh, Underconsumption, overspeculation, and overproduction. If you can solve your overproduction problem by finding new people to buy your goods, you can work your way out of your recession. And so the person he chooses to be Secretary of State, Cordell Hull, 
is a guy who believes in free trade. He's what the speaker yesterday had talked about as one of those uh, democratic um, trader types. He believes that if countries trade with each other, they won't go to war with each other. And so he's the choice for Secretary of State. Now I know Paul gets a lot of bad raps for his later um, time in office, but he does a lot of good things, at least in the, in the first Roosevelt term, in terms of helping produce trade with foreign countries. Um, Hornbeck was a trade guy. He had gotten his first job within the government, tracking trade in China. The United States had its tabs and considerable and increasing trade in the Far East and should keep it, he said. Um, and even Morgenthau, who often interfered with matters of diplomacy to hold chagrin, uh, viewed the importance of China in trade terms. This was, again, in that document about that we needed to do something about the Silver, Pur the Silver Purchase Act. Our trade with China is of considerable importance. We are China's leading customer and leading source of imports, <coughs> and the United States has had a favorable balance on its trade with China throughout the last four years. In the last nine months, the United States supplied 27% of China's total imports, double those supplied by Japan or Great Britain. During the last two years, we have absorbed 18% of total Chinese exports. Our trade with China comprises only about 3% of our total imports and exports. But this measure of the absolute importance of our trade with China is misleading because such trade is of very considerable importance to certain areas and industries in this country. But why focus on trade? Well, it has to do with with what happens next, the next two Roosevelt administrations. And this is what kind of background to all this is and why I think what happens during the first things through the lens of trade. Soon after the start of Roosevelt's second term, an undeclared but brutal war breaks out between China and Japan. During this conflict, the State Department will try to maintain American trade rights and American trade to China. But as Japanese forces move west, grab up the ports along the uh, China seaboard, it makes it far more difficult to make those profits. Even when the Japanese attack three standard vacuum oil tankers and the American warship the USS Panay, the United States does nothing when the Japanese immediately apologize and pay an indemnity. An uneasy peace between the United States and Japan will continue but the most important thing is our trade goes crazy with the, China, the Japanese. Japan is our number three trading partner, and we're making a lot of money supplying them as they fight their war in China. This becomes an issue with some Americans who want to cut off trade to the Japanese that helps them further their aggression, but a lot of people are making a lot of money at this particular point in time. At this, at the, after the first year of Roosevelt's third term, of course, we have the whole, the so-called whole ultimatum when Secretary of State Cordell Hall tells the Japanese ambassador, you have to get out of China, <coughs> we're not opening up a spigot, you can't have our oil, you can't have our allies' oil. And that's led many Americans to assume that because Hall is talking about China, that it's the importance of China that gets us involved in World War II at Pearl Harbor. But I see it far differently. China trade doesn't matter by this point in 1941. What the real conditions that matter was the French Indochina that the Japanese had invaded twice in September of 1940 at the same time they had joined the Axis Pact and in July of 1941 when they grabbed the southern part of it which threatens British uh, colonies such as Malaya important for tin and rubber so needed to defeat the biggest evil in the world at this time Hitler's Germany. I see Hull's ultimatum as not having very much to do with China at all, except for in the sense that Japan needs to be, claims it needs to be in French Indochina in order to prosecute that war against Japan. It's that fear the Japanese will help the Germans by taking over British possessions that leads the United States to try an oil embargo. But instead of being threatened and backing down, the Japanese roll the dice, attack at Pearl Harbor, and two wars in the world become one great war for the greatest generation to fight and defend the United States. Thank you very much. <laughs> Take any, any questions you got for me. Yes. Bill, in your research, did 
did you find any members of the Roosevelt administration pondering the possibility that the Chinese communists might win the Chinese Civil War? I mean, this is going on. Uh, it had been going on for a long time. Yeah, um, not until the Dixie mission in 1944 did we start to see that type of transfer. Um, before then, we just don't know enough about the Chinese communists. They're, uh, by 1934, they get surrounded. And they spend a whole year running around like a Benny Hill show uh, montage around China, 6,000 miles, 18 mountain ranges. And they get up to the far north, and that puts them even further away from any kind of American contact. So we just don't know how important they are. But the Dixie Mission is very impressed with their abilities. And there is that sense, and that's why guys like John Patton Davies get into trouble with some of these anti-communist groups um, after World War II is because of their outspoken um, acknowledgement of how much more able the Chinese leadership, communist leadership is than the national leadership. Thank you very much. How important were human rights issues in the 1940s for the Chinese communist movement? What kind of balance did that consider? When you say human rights, what do you mean? Well, so, so now, I mean, companies investing in China, you can see an immediate exposure to it or could be the right thing to do, I'm not sure which, but uh, that's what companies are considering now when they're looking at the stock in the U.S. or whether it's the Vietnam human rights issues are an issue now. Right. Uh, was, that, was that the same in the 40s? Or? Yeah, you know, I don't really see human rights as being important to American policy until we get to the Carter administration, where it kind of tries to make it look like some of the things that he wants to sort of hammer down the Soviets for. Um, in this period, human rights might be characterized as you should let missionaries do what they want because they're helping the Chinese. Um, it would be more couched in those type of terms. I don't think there's any care for mistreatment of Chinese factory workers in American factories in China or Japanese factories or Chinese factories for that matter. I don't think we see any kind of thing like that. Um, except for there is some work done by the League of Nations in China during the 1930s. And they have um, kind of a... Uh, Union activities group that's trying to make working conditions better. And so there's that sense of, of looking at that. It's less from the American perspective and more from the international labor perspective that we see that. We heard earlier that, that uh, Teddy Roosevelt was a big fan of Japanese martial arts uh, and, and sort of a, a fan of Japan in general. And, uh, was FDR influenced at all by his cousin in his appreciation for China? Uh, or uh, for Christian for Christian. Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, in in his relations with China and FDR's relations with China uh, and, and sort of that waffling that talked about on both sides of the mouth, uh, was any of that uh, influenced by Teddy Roosevelt's appreciation for Japan over China uh, in, in the previous administration? Okay, so you're asking if he was like his like like Teddy in terms of, of favoring Japan over China or was he but was, it, was there any influence? Was there any influence? Uh, whether it was pro-Japan or pro-China. Um, I think Teddy's admiration for the Japanese changes a lot after the Russo-Japanese War and concludes. Um, he's more angry with, the, obviously, the San Francisco school board than he is with the Japanese when it you know, comes up to the gentleman's agreement to kind of um, placate the situation when it comes to the Japanese. But he begins to see the Japanese as a threat in the Pacific. And Roosevelt also does. He writes an article, uh, I want to say 1920, he talks about how Japan could be the next threat, maybe 1923, the next threat in the, in the Pacific. Um, there's, a, there's a real nuanced position that the Roosevelt administration will take. And I'm not sure how much of it is due to Roosevelt himself and how much is due to the underlings that are helping drive the State Department. But it's this attitude that can't do everything the Chinese want us to do in terms of helping them against the Japanese because that would inflame Japanese opinion against the United States and hurt our trading prospects with Japan. But at the same time, we can't do everything the Japanese want us to do because it could bring us back to the 1920s when we saw a lot of anti-foreign reaction against the United States and China. And so we have this like weird middle ground and I call it the yardstick of trade, that we're measuring everything by this, actually I stole it from one of the guys wrote, the yardstick of trade, we're measuring all of our policies on how it's going to affect the trade relationship. And that's why I see that by the time 1941 rolls around, we really don't have any real 
skin in the game when it comes to trade in China anymore because everything's been taken over by the Japanese. And as irritating as that is, there's other money to be made in, in other parts of the world. And that's why I see us more focusing on Southeast Asia as the real cause for the war. I don't know if that answers your question. It, it absolutely it tough one, right?